very lucky that we've been joined by people um, from around the world. And we've, on our panel, is inc includes someone from four different continents. Right. So um, we're going to hear first um, from Matthew, who you heard from this morning. Um, the, the idea is that we're just going to get a sense of how community repair works in different places. Um, we, it will start with a presentation, but then, as I said, you will all have things to add. So after that, we'll kind of, um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll hear from these guys. We'll then ask you guys to just say who you are. We're a small enough group that we can just go around everyone. And then any questions that the presentations have, have triggered, and then we can just kind of use that to, to guide the rest of this, the discussion rather than it being a big Q&A. And some of you might have answers to each other's questions and vice versa, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, so first we have um, Matthew, um, from, who's uh, from Uganda. Then we're going to hear from Meli, who's from Argentina, um, and she runs Club de Reparadores. Then we're going to um, hear from Perna from India, and then, and then we've got Emma, from, who runs a community network in Scotland. Um, uh, so just be thinking about any, of, any questions that get sparked as they're talking. So uh, thank you very much for coming, for turning to this session. Uh, it's not going to be a long one, but uh, uh, as you guys know, there were some points or some parts um, which you were not talked about so much, and uh, that is more specifically on the lesson learned from our operations. And um, I'm going to talk about it and maybe so hear from you people. And finally, I would introduce something uh, that we are planning to do and I'll share it at the end uh, of the conversation. So I will just go straight uh, to the lesson learned. Uh, as we all know, um, I was talking about CC4D, you know, being the only repair uh, uh, organization that offers community repair services in the settlement, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Uganda, because most of the repairers, you know, those are commercial repairers, and they usually you know, charge a lot of money. And I don't know if it's the case with the repairers here in Europe, those guys, they like cheating which is so common. So you find something that can be fixed just at a lower price. You can be charged a lot of money. And until they want you to negotiate and say, ah, you know, um, I have only this amount of money and but they will push you and even make you pay more, which is too bad something that we have learned and we also trying like to to change that perspective you know of uh, people being overcharged or something small because sometimes when i'm fixing i feel like something like someone the the user looks at it as a very big thing but to me i look at it as a small you know problem and sometimes when someone wants to I give money, you know, those days when I was struggling to, uh, to find ways to fill the kit which was given to me by rogue agents and still up to now is not yet full. I remember uh, showing you people uh, a tool kit. Oh. The tool was empty. There were, in another picture, there were two tool kits. One was full and one empty. And I was given a task, you know, to fill. So when someone comes, like, wanted to give me some money and more money, I was like, this is too much. This thing does not cost a lot of money like this. Just give me what you can. And it's now from the person's heart and say, you have done a great job for me. Have this. 
and at the end of the day, he used this money to get more tools and fix it in the toolbox. That's how we're trying you know, to, to fill up the, the toolkit which was provided. And um, I earlier on also talked about the women having the fear of being shocked sometimes, like fear of touching electronics. We did a survey, and uh, in the survey, we're trying to figure out what women love to fix and what we found was like, they were more going on to mending clothes, like showing clothes and we were like, why? Oh no, um, repair of electronics is for men. We can't fix, we can't manage to do that. Say no, let's try this out. And we came up with, a, with our first women inclusion in the repair culture where 12 women were called for two days uh, training. Day one was for a training and day two for repair cafe. So uh, in one of the picture, like uh, <clears throat> that picture at the end where you see those ladies wearing the red cloth, that was day one when the women repaired, cafe was done, and in that learning, they were so impressed. And later, they fixed quite a number of items. I still remember when they worked on a radio, and the radio was able to function, all jubilated, and they were dancing was so good and I felt too proud of myself because I was the one instructing their table. And what we do is whenever we go for repair cafe events, we make sure the women are attached to an expert who keeps on mentoring them slowly and as time goes on, many of the women picked interest and they were like, we have to do this. When the repair cafe ended, we got a lot of comments. I was like, we didn't know that this thing is simple like this, but now we can do it. Even now, uh, last week, they were texting me, when are we having the next repair cafe event? Because now they have picked interest and they wanted to continue with it a lot. And this also has given us momentum to look for more things, for more resources in order to sustain and train more women in repair. Because if you see, many of the things are being fixed by women, you know, at home even. Maybe a man can be in town and you find maybe a socket is not working. How do we do? This woman can easily fix it, not so? So we need to empower more women and to include them in repairs. And I still also emphasize on the Repair Cafe events as um, a platform that brings people together from different angles, hence promoting peace, among especially post-conflict reasons. It's so important. And finally, I don't want to take a lot of time. We are currently um, wanting to popularize the International Repair Day. Last year, we tried it one, but we did not go further, like having a bigger number of people. And this time around, we're trying to at least pull a bigger number of community. And uh, we're looking at 
the partners or the organizations that are working in the refugee camp. Because we, have, we found that there are a lot of environmental uh, operating partners who are in the refugee settlements, but their focus is more into planting trees, um, making these eco-friendly stoves. They have forgotten that the electronic waste contributes a lot to the climate changes or to the global warming. And they have neglected all those. And uh, we're looking at making the International Repair Cafe event happen uh, so that we can bring them and share with them how e-waste contributes to global warming. How does it contribute, how does it contribute to pollution of the environment, the air, the water? What are the dangers? So currently we are running a fundraising. Um, we have not yet met our target, but we believe that the days are nearing. Today is the first, and we are remaining with 14 days to the International Repair Day. Good enough, or the good news is that we can still do it up to the 20th, right? And I'm looking forward to your support to make the event happen. Thank you. Hey, hi everyone, my name is Melina. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Cluda Reparadores. Um, and this attempt is to show a little bit of our work the past seven years already, that's quite a long time. And we explored a lot of uh, dimensions around community repair. Uh, and also share some of the projects that are currently um, ongoing in Latin America as well. So this is something that is not new at all for all of you, um, that our world is broken. And uh, the team that, that are behind the Club de Reparadores um, are really felt that um, this was kind of a, a pressing issue that we should do something about it. And our first approach was getting into waste um, management strategies um, and mostly pr promoting recycling from different uh, kind of approaches. But all of a sudden we realized uh, like being really into the, the topic in Buenos Aires that was quite inefficient and not sufficient as well. So we, we all of a sudden learned about uh, repair cafes and restart parties and said, is this something that we can actually do in our country? Uh, people are, are going to show up. Um, and we realized that repair was uh, much more efficient than recycling and it was much more necessary as to preserve um, the, that knowledge that is embedded in our neighborhoods and in our city. Um, so we like to think that repairing is caring and it's quite urgent uh, given our present uh, ecological and climate crisis. Um, so this is kind of what drove us to, to promoting the, and organizing community repair events. It's like, firstly, we thought it was a way of preventing waste. Uh, also, reducing CO2 emissions um, and making the role of repairers more visible and valuable uh, because we were noticing, in fact, um, that uh, repair shops were closing um, and that they were kind of becoming extinct in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, and also because we believe that repair has this uh, beyond the, the material and concrete parts of repairing an object and extending its useful lifetime. Um, it kind of uh, has a psychomagic effect on people <laughs> and in communities of um, yeah, paying attention to things and stopping to care. So what we intended to do was kind of uh, yeah, an attempt to resignify repair and to make it uh, kind of irresistible and fun. Um, and possible at the same time, right? So in the past seven years, we have organized our activity in, uh, in programs um, around, firstly, organizing ourselves um, events, a community repair events, that we call them the official events, whatever. Uh, and we've done quite a few of them in different kind of uh, open spaces, uh, in public spaces, uh, in cultural centers, um, we also realized that some people approached us and said, okay, 
we want to organize our events. So it's like, yay, obviously. And so we help them out to organize events. And right now, we, there are community groups that organize uh, events in different parts of Argentina. And uh, there's a really strong group in Uruguay and uh, some initiatives in Mexico, Mexico as well. We also um, have the opportunity to work alongside cities or local municipalities or companies as well that uh, had an interest in, in kind of approaching the topic but, but were a bit lost on how to do it. So we co-organize events with them or set out um, sort of in-house events for companies to, to look at how they, their practices were and to involve their their um, fellow employees uh, as well. Um, also, always trying to bear in mind um, of the social impact that could have. So for instance, we something that we do quite often is uh, we receive donations by a charity or a different kind of uh, organization that needs repair because they cannot uh, afford to, to repair the stuff. And so we take it with a, a, a company or whatever and we organize a huge event and then we repair everything and we take it back. So that's something that's been ongoing uh, and it's quite uh, good for everyone. <laughs> and um, soon after some time, we also realized we wanted to work with schools uh, because it was quite uh, fundamental to, to get uh, kids involved in, um, yeah, in repair. So we developed an, a program for schools that started um, with certain activities um, in classrooms, um, like a talk and some um, yeah, training in more so like environmental um, education and uh, circular economy. And we had um, yeah, board games and different kind of um, initiatives. And we had this contest of uh, creating environmental memes, you know, as well, like uh, <laughs> just, just shaking up a little bit the topic. Um, but we soon realized that it was going to be super difficult to scale that project. So we said, okay, we should go directly to teachers. <laughs> so the following year, we worked this with the Ministry of Education of the city of Buenos Aires that uh, has a program that's called Green Schools. Um, so they facilitated a lot, a lot um, our work inside the schools. That is something quite challenging if you come out of nowhere. Um, so the second year we worked with uh, teachers directly and that was a lot better because we could reach a lot more teachers uh, and they did activities with the, within their schools and then we, because of code, it, we'd say we cannot go into schools, schools are closed. So we developed that program online and now you can find all the resources we developed uh, and you can download them uh, for free and also we, we, later on we're going to be showing some videos that we created for that. And last but not least, we realized that we were not focusing a lot in something that's quite essential that is kind of promoting um, the commercial repair sector and keeping it alive or kind of addressing something um, to make them more visible. So what we did is create a repair directory um, to make repair and connect broken objects with repairs, which is quite a challenge. And we're going to also have a session on that tomorrow if you want to learn more. And this is something new that we are uh, going to start um, on the 10th of October, so I should get going <laughs> soon. <laughs> um, we're going to, alongside um, a program of the city government of Buenos Aires, they are kind of in a quite big urbanization uh, process of an area that is in the city center of, of Buenos Aires. As you can see, there is a quite a, one of the most expensive areas of, of the city is just right in the back. And there's this informal settlement that has been going on for uh, long years. And so they invited us over because they are kind of urbanizing the area and they, they identify that a lot of the people that um, try to make an extra income within their neighborhoods resorts to the same kind of uh, trade that is selling things. They just uh, create um, markets and they sell everyday things and that creates a lot of competition among them so they have to lower the prices so that's uh, quite inefficient for them to create a good income so they are trying to um, teach these people uh, with us uh, how to to develop repair skills so that they can come have a different um, kind of employment so this is going to be super fun <laughs> and challenging as well
And then I wanted to share kind of a, a bit of the, the other faces that are behind our, um, our projects. And um, since uh, 2016, um, um, some uh, women from Uruguay that um, have um, an, well, actually a, a design studio approached us and said, we want to replicate the initiative in Uruguay. And ever since they have organized over 22 events uh, in, in, Ur in Montevideo mainly and in different parts of Uruguay as well. And I just, I felt it was uh, super important to see other faces uh, than myself because it's, I'm only like one little part of, <laughs> of the whole movement. Um, and they are super enthusiastic and they created, um, they have really good uh, communicational skills as, as well. So we created like tutorials to teach how to repair uh, while COVID, they did online fixing events. Um, this is another case that's really recent um, because it's interesting to see how the, the community groups have different scales. Um, like the girls are like super professional in what they do and they have this amazing communication um, campaigns around uh, the project. But in this case, um, it's uh, yeah, a woman that approached us and said, I have a garage at home that I would like to turn into a community repair. A center and then she organizes events once a month uh, and it's amazing as well <laughs> so I think that's something that's very valuable in terms of who are the people behind uh, uh, community repair events and this is a case of Córdoba which is a province in Argentina which uh, in this case it was not a person um, nor a company but was a kind of a consortium of NGOs that decided to take on the topic and, um, and promote events. And they are amazing as well. <laughs> they actually are now um, have a, a deal with the local government to have an, they have a, an agenda for the whole of the year. And they do the, these massive festivals with bands and food. And so <laughs> I think it's um, nice to, that you know about that. Um, and in this case, um, this is in Medellin, in Colombia, that there's this place that's called Exploratorio. That's, it's a cultural center that is a city funded as well. Um, and they've been working on, alongside repair for the last uh, two months um, with different community repair initiatives. It's a super nice space. And then Reparalao, which is our, it's in Chile, our neighbor country. Um, we, they have been for quite some time working uh, also with repair. Uh, organizing events and uh, working a lot with companies and how to recover waste and um, and resell uh, products out of waste. And they also organize uh, festivals and quite active in repair. And this is something that I learned just like yesterday or the day before yesterday, which I think it poses a nice... No, James, I told you about this, yeah. Um, that is something funny because... Um, all of a sudden, a friend of mine sent me this link that is uh, from the Instagram page of the city of, of Buenos Aires. And um, they, they are saying they have this really amazing agenda for uh, the whole of October with community repair events, but we were not invited. So I was like, okay, I'm frustrated. <laughs> but then, like thinking uh, two times about this, it's like, okay, our job is done. No, kind of what we intend behind uh, what we do is like for actually having a reaction and a more sustained uh, impact, right? And when something is turned into a city policy or initiative, it's like, okay, so I can, so I'm quite happy about this. I don't have to organize everything, you know, it's just going to happen. <laughs> um, and one, one last conclusion that I think that um, I've been thinking about lately um, in terms of how, of what are the characteristics of community repair back home or what I know about in the region, um, is that we learn from uh, European projects, right? Like a repair cafe, like the restart parties. And that's how we sort of imported this idea of community repair. And I think we are in, right now in the process of um, identifying and, and learning how to actually decolonize or look for our own identity within community repair. Um, and we have a manifesto, certainly, <laughs> because we believe, yeah, that repairing is a lot of things like taking care of our planet and fighting obsolescence and saving resources. 
Uh, here's our team um, that is spread out around the world right now. Um, but we're all female-led uh, team, and that's something that we also identify, that all the organizers tend to be uh, women back home <laughs> and in the region. So if you're interested in collaborating or, getting, or knowing more about us, you can either follow us on social media or just write us in this email. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have nothing to show, so you have to listen. Look at me only. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I can tell you some, some bit of my experiences. Uh, uh, when we started doing this Repair Cafe in 2015, um, you know, every time we thought that the Repair Cafe Bengaluru has ended and it has actually come up with a new thing. So. Somehow this whole uh, Repair Cafe thing is pushing us to do, to innovate and uh, think about uh, this repair as a, uh, as a subject and uh, we are rediscovering ourselves every day. I'll tell you how. Uh, when we started in 2015, we thought that we just wanted to do uh, these workshops. So these are all, uh, we thought of design, doing only pop-up workshops. So we were doing pop-up workshops and there were a good response from resident welfare associations, from schools, from uh, in, uh, you know these design firms. They are all have given us spaces and they want us to do these repair cafe workshops. So we are very interested to do it. We are very excited to do it. And we did about like more than 40 workshops, um, you know, and we are continue to do it. But then we felt that in India, this repair cafe format doesn't work. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, well, this concept has started in Europe because uh, the repair is expensive here. But in India, this is the other story. We are a developing nation and we have repairs around the corner available. Uh, we have... A f uh, yesterday, I raised the question on informal repairs. So we, in India, we have... 99% uh, of our labor force which are informal and they are available on the streets and a percentage of them are in repair business. So repair is just stone's throw away for us. So people uh, in our country, they don't appreciate, we thought so, they don't appreciate this repair cafe format. Uh, but uh, as I told you, they didn't uh, come up in the workshops also. We tried hard. We were sitting for half a day, full day sometimes. We were doing a bit of bit, a bit of repair. Uh, we did some good number of repairs also sometimes. But we were feeling frustrated that, okay, why people are not responding here? And then came the pandemic, which is 2019 onwards. And uh, I wanted to conduct a summer training program for children, which generally I used to do before that as a workshop. And then suddenly happened, what happened is, uh, we started this online program for children and this program was on home maintenance. So children are actually sitting in their homes and they are being taught how to repair uh, small, small things in their homes. For example, uh, if the tap water, uh, if the water is not coming properly from the tap, can you change the filter? Is there something called filter exists? So we introduced them and they were super excited uh, about these modules. And, uh, and when I, uh, and there are like till now about more than 70 uh, children have attended online. This is for the last three years I'm doing it. And we have all our volunteers who became teachers and these volunteers are basically homemakers and they are interested in maintenance. So they share their experience in the form of training modules. And when I checked with the parents, guess what? Can anybody guess? Parents wanted to join, but they are the one who are following Repair Cafe from the day it was started but they never came to the workshops. I don't know if it is embarrassment. I had a mixed feeling, but they are following us. We thought that they are gone, but they are following us. 
and they felt regret. They said, um, we wanted to come, but uh, we could not come to your workshops because of whatever reasons, but we want to connect with you. So maybe this is the reason that we want to connect with you. So children came in hordes, and these are the parents who are following repair cafes, and we were like shocked to hear all this. People are very, I mean, you know, the people are quite amazing. Uh, I mean, you don't know how will they react, but uh, I feel one has to understand what is their needs. Now, as I said, we kept on rediscovering ourselves. So we came out from the mode of workshops. Uh, our workshops are there. It is still organized. Uh, but we started making, we have actually recently we made WhatsApp groups. It's city-based WhatsApp groups. So right, right now we have three WhatsApp groups which are running in three cities, like you know one in Bangalore, one in Chennai, and one in Hyderabad. And guess what is this WhatsApp groups are all about? There, the DIY repair discussions happens. Repair referrals are suggested between the people who are interested because anybody who is living in that particular city, they are interested in a local repair information because they need to repair their tarps, they need to repair their iron boxes, they want to know where are the spares available, which are the local markets, so there, the, and, and people are sharing their information, their knowledge. They are not, there are no experts sitting in these groups, but there are people who are regular uh, maintainers and they are sharing information between each other. So that was a revelation. Oh my God, this is a WhatsApp group, which is a WhatsApp group, you know, it is just hi, hello, happy birthday, uh, you know, condolences and this and that, but there is no such thing happens. There are actually DIY repair discussion happens. I mean, and who are these people? Again, we, we started following you in 2015. We didn't want to, we hadn't, uh, you know, attended your workshop, but we wanted to connect with you. We wanted to join you. This is their way of connecting with us. So, I mean, uh, people are surprised us. So at every stage, we kept on uh, rediscovering ourselves. And so, uh, so uh, these are some of the things that we started and somehow the movement has not ended and it has gone beyond Bangalore. Now I have uh, other cities which are coming up. And India has a great potential. People have repair knowledge. They need a platform where they can talk about it because we have a culture. We don't, we don't throw anything. We also thought that India is now into consumerist culture and people are interested in throwing things, but it's only the uh, reality happens in the city, not beyond that. So we are wrong and we are proven wrong and people are still interested in repairing their things and which is a great revelation for us being a repair cafe Bengaluru. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk about the Share and Repair Network in Scotland. So I work with Circular Community Scotland. Um, we are a charity that supports other charities and social enterprises. We do that by representing our members and supporting them. And I work more specifically with sharing libraries and with repair projects. So it started because um, Scotland, well, the sharing libraries were all wanting to have a kind of network to formalise um, how they work together and everything. Um, so they started working with Circular Community Scotland to have um, regular networking meetings. Um, and then the Scottish Climate Assembly happened. So we had 100 people, um, representative of the community, were given evidence by experts on what to do about climate change, including um, the CEO of our organisation. And um, they gave recommendations to the government about how to combat climate change and one of the strongest recommendations was to support reuse. And that was the joint strongest one with 97% of people wanted to su more support for reuse. And one of the specific recommendations was to support a network of sharing libraries. So um, our organization put together a proposal in partnership with Edinburgh Tool Library and Edinburgh Makery. And we presented it um, just on time to give Scottish Government and Zero Waste Scotland a nice shiny um, new story to put out um, during COP26 to support our network, to set up this network for sharing libraries. 
and repair projects. So the Sharon libraries that we support could be libraries of things, tool libraries, um, basically non-profit organizations that run projects that share things. People can borrow things rather than books. Um, and then repair projects. So again, any non-profit organization that runs repair cafes, but also repair services. Um, so, but just as long as the person brings something into repair and it goes back to the person who brought it in, that's kind of where we draw the line with repair. So I just thought I would give you some examples of the kind of projects that we support. Um, so our partner, one of our partners is Edinburgh Makery. They're a social enterprise and they um, do a lot of work in refurbishing computers. So they take donations of IT, um, any kind of devices, and they refurbish them and they sell them or donate them to people who need them. And they also run workshops on repair and upcycling, including repair bars, which work much like repair cafes. There's a general store, Selkirk, so they're a community interest company um, and they're a repair shop. They call themselves a repair mongery. They, um, they list what kind of things that they repair on their website. So they say they do laptops, tablets, lamps, vacuum cleaners, radios, power tools, irons, clothes, china, garden tools, and they give up and say, oh, for goodness sake, if you can bring it in, we can take a look. So you go in there, you pay them a fee, they'll, look, they'll take it away and their staff will repair it for you. And there's a pram project that was born out of Repair Cafe Glasgow. So Repair Cafe Glasgow were offered a massive donation of broken prams, basically, and realised there was a demand for prams as well. Um, so you can bring your pram in and get it serviced if you have one. Maybe you've, you had a child and then you've got a second child and you want to make sure the pram's in good nick. You can bring it in, or if you buy one secondhand somewhere, you can bring it in, get it serviced, refurbished and repaired. And what they do is they generate an income by taking the ones that are donated to them, refurbishing them and selling them secondhand. Um, selling them, selling them onwards. They also donate a lot of um, prams to support families who are struggling um, financially. And it's really the difference they're making in people's lives is incredible when you realize like the impact that not having a pram has on anyone who's um, maybe doesn't have access to a car or single parent families. It's really um, crucial to them being able to have access to services and um, being able to have the well-being of going to the park. And then we support more traditional projects. So there's Repair Cafe Cairngorms, that's your traditional repair cafe. They're volunteer-led, self-sufficient. They have monthly repair cafes and it's run by a village hall. It always makes me laugh when I came to this event, they described it as being quiet. To me, that's a really busy, thriving, happy event. So the aim of our network is to support um, and represent both new sharing libraries and repair projects that, as they're getting set up and also um, to help the existing ones to grow their impact and become more financially sustainable. We're doing that through setup guides, training, events, developmental support, specialist support and representation. Um, so some of the challenges that we're having is um, a, lot of, a lot of projects were fully funded in Scotland a few years ago. Um, so they've all been set up with significant um, revenue costs and everything. They've, got on loads of staff and they've made this great project and then that funding got slashed. So a lot of our projects are in, really in crisis mode. So, you know, we've been funded to set up, help lots of more groups set up, but at the same time, the ones that we have are struggling. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, bring in more funding for the groups that exist and the ones that are getting set up. Um, another challenge, but also a great thing, obviously, is the diversity of groups. Um, so as you saw, we have ones that are generating an income, ones which are your traditional repair cafes and trying to find ways to support all of them can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Um, a lot of groups come to me and they say, what is the best way of attracting a volunteer, for example? And I, I'm very bad for saying, well, it depends on your community and it depends on, you know, you know your area best. I can't answer that, but obviously I need to give answers. So one thing I try to do is to, and it's getting easier as we go along and I'm learning more and more groups is I can at least say, I'll give them that answer, but then say, in another rural area, this is what a group's done, or in another area of deprivation, this is what another group's done. And I think that's really valuable for groups to be able to learn from each other. Um, and also a lot of what the network to do is to bring them together so they can learn from each other and to support them financially so they can take the time to teach each other. Um, communication, so I think this is a really common issue for all networks, is that not everybody wants to communicate through the same means of communication. So some people love Facebook, some people hate Facebook, some people love Slack, some people hate Slack. 
and just trying to get everybody in the same place is I've just kind of given up now and gone with the majority and just made a Slack group and put out a newsletter, but it can be, it can be a little bit tricky. And the other challenge is geographical spread. So as you can see, some of our groups, it's not a big country, it's a very small population, but there's a massive geographical spread. So we've got some in the cities and some really far away. So trying to get everybody in the same room is impossible pretty much. So one thing we're doing is everything is online at the moment, except for our online conferences. And that's really working well because it means that someone, you know, on an island can, can come to it as easily as everybody else. So that's basically all I have to say. If you want to get in touch by anything, I'd love to hear from you. Those are my contact details. Thanks very much. Thank you all. It's been really interesting hearing about the massive diversity in how you've approached the problem of getting people to repair um, and to the, to the point where you think your job's done. <laughs> uh, in that respect, anyway. So, um, so what we thought we'd do now is... Um, there's, could those of you at the back come forward a bit so that we can make it a little bit more of a discussion? Um, and I know that we've got people from around the world and a lot of you will be involved in community care. So can we just go around and um, it'll be a bit clunky because of the microphone and just kind of get a sense of, obviously, your name, how you're involved in, in repair and where you're based. Um, and then any kind of big questions that, have, that this discussion has brought up or, or, or things that you've been kind of uh, thinking about lately uh, that you that the rest of the group might be able to help. And so once we've gone round, um, I'll just, I'll keep an, um, an eye on questions and then we'll kind of pull out the ones that come up a lot, if that's okay. Hello, uh, my name is Louise. I'm from France. Um, I've been involved with repair in different situations. So I'm part of an association, a local association that helps people build and repair stuff. So I'm, I'm mostly on Woodcraft, but uh, there is also like electronics and leather and cosmetics and different kind of stuff. Um, and I also work on a project to help create a mobile repair space in France for forcibly displaced persons to fix uh, stuff on their own. Thank you. Hi. Okay. <laughs> My name is my name is Jean Sebastien. I'm from Montreal, Canada. I'm working for a company that's called InsurTech. We're in social inclusion program for people from 16 to 35. We're mostly refurbishing computers and phones. Uh, we've been holding restart parties, uh, which we call Repar au temps, because we need to translate everything in Quebec, um, since 2015. Um, and that's about it. Hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Mercedes. Uh, I'm based in the UK and um, we run a non-for-profit called Merit. And we, we, it's a bit of a circular economy. We, we mainly specialize in the training young people how to become IT technicians. But it really comes from the idea that hardware and software is the new reading and writing, and it should be accessible to everybody. You know, we all have devices in our hands all the time, and if you know how they work and how to fix them, whether it is you fixing them or not, you are you become a better um, better. But you can buy better. You can understand why repair can be expensive. So we try to teach, but well, we teach many different um, audiences as well, um, from children in schools to um, elderly in community centers uh, through digital skills. And we don't sell at the moment. We donate everything that gets repaired by our students. We just donate it and put it back into the community. Hi, my name's Dave. I'm from London in the UK. Um, I was one of the founding members of Hackney Fixers, which was one of the first groups that sprung off from Restart um, about eight years ago. Um, we've been doing 
repair cafes, big fixing events where we've had, um, I think we had 30 fixes to one event fixing electronics, electrics, bikes, fabrics, furniture. I think that was about it. Um, and since then, I've moved, on, I've moved out of Hackney. I'm now in South London. I'm helping with the repair cafe there. Um, we're going to start another repair cafe as well at some point in the near future. Hello, my name is Cora. I'm from Norway and this summer I started a company making it easier for consumers to repair their clothes. So through my service you can um, book and uh, order your uh, repairs online. I come and pick it up at your place and bring it to our tailor who will repair your clothes and I deliver it back home at your doorstep. So uh, my business tried to make it as easy as ordering something from H&M online uh, to make it as easy to repair. Hello. <laughs> just, just, for, just for test. Um, my name is Asha. Um, uh, I live in Amsterdam. We started six months ago for our repair cafe uh, with my ex-company. We are doing consulting for sustainability. Um, so we finally decided to do some, some stuff with our hands, not writing reports and making beautiful data visualization about impact. Uh, so yeah, I'm learning a lot and I have a lot of questions how to make it better and better to bring uh, somewhere else. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Thomas Snyder and I come from the region of Bonn. Um, I repair my whole life, machines, furniture, building furniture, um, working as a house technician, and um, now I'm six years ago, uh, I go to repair cafes, and I like to repair, it gives me a good feeling when things are broken. Um, the reaction of the people, they're very happy that things are working. At, I see an old lady, I worked, uh, Two and a half hours on, yeah, it was a waffle machine, uh, two hours to put the staff out and half an hour to repair. But they were happy, the old lady was. Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Eduardo from uh, Rius, and we are a European organization representing social enterprises in the field of uh, circular economy. So we advocate for right to repair at EU level. And I have no particular question, but just a big thank you to the speaker for showing us what repair is like uh, outside the EU to show us your concrete experience, because it can also be helpful for us in advocating at EU level. So really, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Charlie from Resource Futures in Bristol. I'm the community impact lead there, and we have uh, six projects. Um, one of those is, uh, or soon to be two, supporting a network of community action groups, which includes Library of Things, um, repair cafes, community larders, all sorts of different things. Um, and another um, that's quite relevant to this is um, a bus called Fixie, which is in the rural community, um, which is doing repair, but also um, collecting uh, te technology, basically, to redistribute. Um, so, I guess that yeah, it's been really, really interesting listening to everyone on the panel. And I think it's interesting how, in some ways, developing countries are quite far ahead of us in terms of reuse and repair, um, being in, in the culture. Um, also, in one session, heard about um, how Australia have just made amazing inroads in their data and copyright working with the um, car industry. So I think it, it's, a, it's great to hear all these ideas. I guess it's thinking, how can we... Um, have a forum to share all the time, I guess, so we can be always learning from each other in this way, building on this kind of sharing on an international level that we're doing here, would be my question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Alex Benadier. I'm from uh, South Africa, and uh, I'm doing a PhD here in, in Belgium at K Leuven uh, about business models for repair. So I'm trying to find ways to make repair more self-sufficient 
uh, and uh, in the current policy environment. So in the current policy environment, how can uh, repair be more sustainable? Um, and I would just uh, also like to say, I think it's interesting for me coming from South Africa, I think it's similar to a lot of other African countries. Here I've noticed in Belgium that there is a lot of uh, devices that could be repaired being thrown away which is often not really the case in South Africa. If In South Africa, if people, even if someone throws something away, someone will go to the garbage uh, dump, pick it up, repair it, and then sell it or keep it or use it or something like that. So um, that's quite a big difference. Uh, so even though, you know, Belgium is was such a developed country, but uh, in that way, uh, South Africa or other African countries are better in that sense. Yeah, thank you. Yes, you just said. Um, my name is Vilda. I'm also from Norway. <laughs> and I run Restarters Norway. So it's kind of the same as the Restart group. So we have FixFest and we work politically to, like, yeah, make the political and the policymakers change the way they think about repair. So, yeah. And for now, we're having fixed fest and I'm just trying to figure out how I can do that in a way that's more like for young people because the problem in Norway is that the young, younger generation uh, doesn't go to fixed fest because it's not hip in the same way as clothing, fixing clothing. So yeah, that's why I'm here. Hello. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Enzo, I'm uh, coming from France. I'm, what, I'm working at the AMRES, Maison Régionale de l'Environnement et des Solidarités. It's uh, the regional home um, for the environment and the solidarity. Uh, I'm working on uh, the development of a numeric platform uh, for the network of uh, the Repair Café in the north of the France. Hello, I'm Arne from Denmark, and uh, I'm a volunteer in uh, three repair cafes. In the repair cafes in Denmark, they are normally open once a month in a couple of hours, two, three, four hours. Uh, some are open a bit more. We have a policy of what we repair, saying that if you can bring it to the table, then we will repair it, at least if it doesn't require a microscope. So uh, that's my start into this. But then a uh, year ago, I also uh, entered in as a volunteer in our national board, uh, which is an organization supporting all the repair cafes with whatever we feel that they would like us to do. So we have some uh, development uh, projects going on there. For the time being, it's uh, making a mobile uh, repair cafe from either a trailer or from a bike. Got two, two projects there. And we are taking part in the political discussions because what we do is they, we more or less gather the strength of all the repair cafes. We've got 70, or in fact 73 repair cafes in Denmark. And we gather the strength for them to try to approach the politicians. Right now we are having problems because they say there's going to be an election and they can't talk with us, which we do not understand, of course. Uh, and uh, we uh, represent the organization on different kind of cultural events and stuff like that. Uh, I have a question for at least three of the earlier speakers. Uh, Argentina and India and uh, you said UK, you all mentioned that you do training for children. What I was interested in is when you say children, well, you said high school, but what, what are the age we're talking about? We've, we've got some activities uh, regarding uh, public school children, fifth grade, but I would like to know what age are you talking about in your projects? 
Hi, my name is Lynn and I'm uh, one of the coordinators of the German network for community repair groups. And yeah, we support um, repair, repair cafes um, all over Germany uh, via email or phone support. We are um, doing not network um, events for them in different regions or a big network event and we build up, um, so we are doing this since 2014 and um, yeah, we build up a website where they can register and doing profiles and talking about the events and where we um, share all the knowledge about how to set up a repair cafe and um, yeah, and we publish a little magazine, it's called Splitter. Um, where we collect all um, stories about repair. And um, yeah, and this year we were really happy that um, a lot of um, new repair cafes um, were, um, yeah, after the, the, the two or three years, um, the last two or three years, there now a lot of new repair cafes are coming up. And I think we have around um, 1,000 repair cafes in Germany. Um, I'm Holly, I'm based in London and I work with, uh, for the Restart Project, so I feel like I'll give other people <laughs> more time to answer questions and stuff, because... <laughs> oh, no, I'll just be like... Okay. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. I, um, I, for me, at least, it was really helpful to just get a sense of who's in the room and also hear about your projects. Um, so, uh, there were a few questions that came up. Just in terms of the forum to share how we carry this conversation on. There's a session on that tomorrow afternoon. I think it's, I'll have to, I can't remember if it's, it's straight after lunch or after that, but it's, it's all about the global networks. Might even be before lunch. I'll double check and <laughs> let you know. Um, so, so join that, because that's exactly what that conversation is about. There was a very clear question about training for children and what age. So perhaps we can um, tackle that. And I wonder if, and I think if there's any other questions that people had, it, uh, let me know. But there, it felt like there's an, there was another question that came up from the panel, which was um, the challenge of it's relatively easy to get startup funding, but then how do you get how do you keep it going? Um, so if anybody's got any any examples of how that's worked, either on the panel or in the audience, that would be great. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, since, since we're talking about like cultures of repairs. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about repair in multicultural environment and that might be a question for all of you but maybe for you Matthew as well on uh, if you could share about experiences of repairs with potentially different languages and different nationalities and if you've been uh, like how did it go and uh, how is it with translation? How is it with a different approach of repairing, potentially? Thank you. And if anyone in the, the public <laughs> has some element of answer as well, thank you. Cool. Let's do that one first. Um, and then we'll go on to the training young people and then we'll see how much time we've got. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, our operation in the multilingual communities that uh, uh, we involve people who are from the different, you know, ethnicities and the different tribes. At least we involve them uh, during our repair cafe events so that uh, we clear out issues around the language barriers. So having people who speak multiple languages has helped us a lot in uh, solving issues in regard to the language problem. Thank you. Um, actually, um, uh, in our country also we are multilingual and multicultural, but you know, uh, when you strike on the subject of repair, it doesn't matter. Because everybody understands that we have come from repair for doing something which is... So, uh, I mean, that is a great power. I mean, it's. I feel it's like a spiritual power of repair that, you know, it really transcends into connection between the people of different cultures, different uh, places. I mean, people connect instantly, even if they can't communicate. Thanks. 
answer, maybe not, not on this one, but about the age. Um, so we might as well. Um, well, in our case, it's high school, so they are like from 13 to 17, uh, depending on the school, uh, the teacher. And... Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so thanks. So what we found is that uh, children who are eight years and above, like till 14 years, they are super excited about anything unstructured, uh, uh, you know, education. So repair is one of them. Something where they can make and break things. This age group is super excited about experimenting. The problem starts after 14. When the mind is already set and they say, yeah, I've already done it, leave it. So uh, this age group, uh, whether you want to do training programs, you want to offline, they are super excited. And any subject, whether it's cycle repair, electrical, anything. You give it and they have it. Of course, they have some fear about stitching because guys are just not interested in, they know how to, they don't know how to even thread the needle. That's a problem. I don't know, it's a mindset or I don't know what is it. I mean, I, I remember in one of the classes, the guy has said, no, I will not do it. I'll tell my mother to do it. I said, the training program is not for you. I mean, not for your mother, it's for you. So I don't know, it's some, some mindset problem, but uh, rest is this age group is super excited about any repairs. Thank you. Um, we, we, we specialize on 18 onwards, uh, difficult to reach teenagers for our um, you know, become an IT technician program, but we taught from five years onwards. Uh, obviously, totally different programs, but um, I will agree that from eight years old, we've seen a lot of potential of how quickly they pick it up. And and you know what we teach, for example, in a, in four hours lesson to teenagers, you teach the same downgraded in the terminology and, you know, but, that, but the same, same concepts to eight years old. So they pick it up in an hour, like I know what you're talking about is, and I think is the enthusiasm. They might not pick up all the, the knowledge and the, and, and the um, theory that is necessary, the vocabulary that is necessary, terminology, but they, they grasp the concept really, really well. So eight to 10, 12 is an amazing age to get really, Get them started that we we have done courses for five years old and you know it's fun um so did anybody have any brain waves or tips about ongoing funding keeping projects going once you've got past the startup phase um if you can get it depending on the environment. Let me tell the story about Hackney Fix. It took us four years to get our first local government grant, but once they've given you one grant, then you're in with, you know, there's a certain inertia in local government for this. Once they've given you one grant, they're happy to give you another one because you're then an approved organisation. They know you, you know what forms to fill in, you know all the bureaucracy. But it takes you a long time to get to that stage. Do you? So it takes you a long time to get to that stage. Otherwise, you know, you can founder in the meantime. So in the meantime, volunteers are very important. You need to keep that consistency going so you can have, you know, we had a wonderful guy, James, who just did all the boring bureaucracy, filling in the forms, applying for grants, all that kind of thing. And if you don't have that, then you'll get nowhere, right? But yeah, just keep on going. That's the trick, right? Be boring, just keep on going, keep on applying for grants from foundations, from local government, charities, everything. Eventually you'll get somewhere. But once you've got one lot of money, of course, people think you're successful and they want to be a part of that. And so suddenly more money appears like magic. Um, my experience is from the UK only. Um, um, we, we really struggle with uh, getting funding, not because we don't get funding, we get a lot of funding. You know, you look at our organization and you say, hey, you are really successful. But the problem is that um, once you are growing in the UK, you only get, funders only tend to give you 20% of your 
income from the previous year. So if, um, you know, if you last year did 10,000 pounds, you are only going to get 2,000 pounds. And maybe your costs for that year are 30,000 pounds, which is always going to be insufficient because um, it's very difficult to care funding for core cost, which is salaries, room rental, electricity, you know, what keeps you running. You will get funding for running a project, which uses all your resources and, and you can get yourself into a circle of just running after the money all the time instead of using your resources for actually doing the job. That could be a lot of, uh, uh, quite a burned out. But um, I, I'm, I'm just quite impressed with the um, repair together and their, um, the mobile repair thing. Um, they are funding, well, they just told me that they got funding from uh, the Waste Authority. Um, I really have a feeling <laughs> that um, waste authorities should, you know, should really be funding a lot of the work we do because, um, you know, it's a movement from the community. I see it as it is a cultural change, but the money should come from the government, it should come from the waste authority. So possibly um, also saying, look, this is working in a different country, this is working in a different city, they're doing it, we want to do it here as well. Um, again, this networking, that could be really good because then we could share data and, and replicate it. Um, we had a good um, discussion in the last session about how, how to make high street repair more sustainable, so that really fits in with what... Um, you were saying. But anyway, it's an ongoing discussion. Nobody has, unfortunately, the, the right answer. Um, Emma had a response to one of the earlier questions. Um, yeah, to the question about languages earlier, um, I just wanted to give an example of how I agree with your point that language actually doesn't matter that much at a repair cafe, in that we had a repair, um, one group repair cafe, Glasgow, has a really nice example of an asylum seeker who came from Syria, who's now um, speaking English because he came to join the repair cafes to learn English. And it was a really good chance for him to meet people to have the chance to speak in English with. So actually, I think they can be a really good opportunity to help people with languages as well as not being an, a barrier to people taking part in them. Thank you. So we've got a little bit of time left of the session, um, but the next one is in here. Um, so are there any other kind of more burning questions be before we finish? No, like if you have a question, answer it, yeah. Oh, it's not a question, but I've been talking to a lot of you during the last two days here. And one of the things that I have noticed that you find a bit interesting is that we use for our recruiting of cafes uh, into our network uh, that we can help these in a way that they really want to. It's just as you said over there, it, you give information on how to start network, how to recruit uh, volunteers, but our main trump in our uh, bouquet of uh, offering is that every, every cafe that joins our network has automatically an insurance covering any errors in the, the products that have been repaired. We don't cover the insurance as when they are working because that's a personal liability insurance that's covering that, but we have an insurance that is covering any damage result from bad repairs. Not that we've had any, of course, but uh, it's a very much uh, helping us recruiting uh, cafes into the network. Thanks, that's, that's a really good piece of advice. And on that note, I wonder if the panelists could each give us your number one piece of advice for people um, helping community repair. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I've just sprung this on them, I didn't give them a warning, so, yeah? Uh, but I guess um, it's really, it, it really has a lot to do with uh, kind of uh, con conducting voluntary energies uh, to some extent, because um, many people uh, approach uh, or are get, wanna get involved with community repair on a voluntary basis and uh, and it's true, it is something quite difficult uh, to, to finance. I mean, we struggle a lot and we got really creative in terms of 
who to ask, how to ask, what to offer, what not to offer, where to do it, <laughs> who to get in, who should get involved. Um, so I think it's it's kind of um, in in the end what we are really trying to do is kind of contribute to a cultural shift around repair, um, trying to yeah make repair easy, make repair attractive, and you were talking about making it cool for uh, young people. We also try to do that. Um, so then I think it's kind of a, it's not something that's going to happen from one day to the, to the next. This is not a short advice. I'm sorry, <laughs> not good to make a synthesis. But I, I would like to say that uh, it's kind of um, like kind of being patient and and caring for the process, um, and yeah, and, and try and basically collaborating. That's the word. The book collaborating, just like with energy. Uh, I, I sorry, I don't have any advice to give, but I like the fact that uh, this whole uh, idea of repair cafes and uh, restart and such movements are the information, the knowledge is evolving. This is a very interesting stage of uh, this, and I'm part of this ev evolving stage. I'm very glad, I'm glad of it. I think, I mean, that's that's <laughs> that's good good enough for me at least. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Uh, mine is about uh, keeping updated the databases, um, which is so important that every repair cafe should uh, take it um, so that we all fill up the central database. I think uh, Restart has uh, started it, and I was looking into pre previous... Uh, repair cafe events that have been organized and some of the repair cafe uh, places. Uh, they have created the event, but you find what had happened is not being entered. Yeah. Uh, even us, we are also victim, but uh, we'll, you know, take it up and fill it. Yeah. So that's something that I feel we should improve on. Thank you. Um, something I think that's really important for um, supporting groups that are wanting to get started is um, just giving them a bit of reassurance. Like I've had groups come to me and say, I've got a few volunteers and we've got a space and we've all got our own tools, but I don't think we're ready. And you know, I'm like, you're much more ready than we were before we started. Like you're 10 steps ahead of where we were. Do it tomorrow, you can, you can get it started. Or they're a little bit frightened about the electrical side of things. So I've had an engineer say to me that he's too scared to do it for people. And it's like, the insurance is there, the, the electrical safety checking is there, it's, you can do it tomorrow. So I think a lot of the time it's just giving people that bit of reassurance that, that it's not that difficult actually. I mean, it, it has difficult moments, but in the grand scheme of things, it, it can be done quite easily. And I think reassurance that it's not that difficult is a great way to finish. We've no, not, not quite finished. Hang on. One more thing that we learned is publicity, right? Spam every channel you've got on social media, right? Don't be afraid. People think, oh, yeah, if we just put up, you know, if we put it on Facebook, everybody will know about it. No, they won't. You know, some people hate Facebook. Some people hate WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. Spam every single channel you can. You know, put it in local newspapers if you can, um, every single social media. Put up posts, drawing old-fashioned posts that work really well. The first big event that we had, we, I just put up posters all around the area. We got th literally a 1,000 people, right? So publicity, like crazy. You know, tell your friends, get it on next door, get it on whatever social media channels you have, especially the local ones, you know. The local, you know, things like there are usually neighborhood Facebook groups, things like that. Find every single one, get on right? Thank you, and actually on, on that note, Perna, I was think the one thing I took away from your presentation was, was like use Facebook group, uh, WhatsApp groups. So, um, so I thought that, um, so that, that fits in really well with, with what Dave said. So thanks very much to our brilliant panel from around the world. Thank you. And thank you to those of you in the audience who also took part and, and shared your knowledge.